So I'm Franklin. I am an attorney and I am also a professor. So today in the session, I'm going to be talking about creator economy law and more focused specifically on AI and how it is impacting the creator economy. But yeah, see Christian, you joined. Did you want to jump in or anything? Say anything before I get started? Um, no, absolutely. Forgive me. I was, okay. uh, I was backstage <laughs> presenting, so please go, go for it. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so very quickly, um, I'm not here in my capacity uh, working for a healthcare company that I work for. Um, I'm more so here um, in connection with the academic work that I do, teaching courses um, and all of that, but that's just a very brief bio on me. I'm not gonna waste too much of your time on all of that. Um, I'll move on into the actual presentation. So very quickly, I wanna give everyone a roadmap, an overview of the creator economy and kind of level set here about what my talk in the industry that I'm specifically focused on, and then I'll get into the generative AI aspect of it. So for Creator Economy 101, so what is a creator? It's individuals such as artists, entertainers, writers, and educators who create content and distribute it through internet platforms. So you see on the little word um, chart there, a lot of different terms can be thrown around for creators and what the um, content creators or internet creators are within the ecosystem of the creator economy. But it's also important to think about um, within the creator economy, you, you have other players. You have platforms that host content or distribute content, and you also have the brands and the marketing and advertising dollars that flow in and help support this creator economy. Uh, so again, defining creator, typically you, you have on a platform users that are generating content. It's kind of a play on a term in the US at least that we call user-generated content. Um, but pretty much anyone that is active online uh, on social media, LinkedIn, X, Facebook, you name it, or Twitter, TikTok, uh, is someone that is generating content. Um, but then you have these subsets and kind of where the creator economy is focused and the focus of this talk is on the subset, the creators, and even more so uh, a, a subset of creators are influencers, the people that are trying to monetize and sell something or uh, upsell products or services. So uh, yeah, so very briefly, creator economy is, is, a, is a result of the web 2.0 uh, movement of being able to democratize, democratize content publishing. Um, like I said, UGC, user-generated content. And it's also a result of decreased cost and increased quality of consumer electronics. And we're really seeing that in the generative AI space. So about a year ago, we saw ChatGPT come to the market and that was a commercially available um, and tool that anyone could access. And, and the barrier to entry there is way low now, um, also on the, on the AI side. Um, and then also just even if you think about it, the platforms, being able to upload a video to YouTube and have somewhere that it's hosted, you don't have to think about it. All of that has just ex have caused an explosion of content uh, and people that are able to monetize and, and build brands and build businesses and build um, a livelihood around it. Uh, and then, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic triggered a huge growth in the creator economy. And on this next slide, you'll kind of see over the years, there have been some numbers coming out about the jump of people that are considering themselves creators. Um, but the more important thing on this slide right here is that in uh, 2023, earlier this year, Goldman Sachs estimated that the creator economy is worth about $250 billion. So, of course, you can imagine if you're an AI developer, uh, if you're somebody that's targeting consumers in that area with a product or service, it's obviously a market that has uh, some dollars to spend. All right, so I hope that was a great overview of creator economy. I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but I also wanted to level set and kind of give framework for thinking if you're not familiar with the term creator economy. All right, so AI in the creator economy, just like pretty much any other industry, it's not really anything new. Uh, so we've had editing and content creation tools that have integrated AI or machine learning aspects in some, some capacity. So that could be either the editing or the content creation. So Adobe Sensei, their machine learning tool has been around or the, on the backside of, of their operations for quite a while. Um, something as simple as, or simple I say, but uh, <laughs> maybe not simple. Uh, something as complex as rotoscoping. Uh, so cutting people out of videos, that's been around in Adobe um, After Effects and other tools, even Premiere and, and others. Background removal tools, Canva um, has this. Now you just click a button and it removes the background from an image or a person. Uh, CGI, that's been a huge one. A lot of CGI is just algorithmically based um, computations and um, calculations of, of math, uh, for lack of a better term there, of, and then it's then it's rendered out and presents something on the screen in the form of pixels that we encounter uh, and then also captions and subtitles a lot of people forget that 
when you upload a video to YouTube, you can now have automatic captions or automatic subtitles. Same thing on TikTok, same thing on almost any platform now, you can have auto captions generated. And that's also from a accessibility standards standpoint, but also just if you have sound off, you wanna watch a video and just get those, um, those uh, be able to hear or be able to understand what's going on in the video and, and not hear, but read what the person's saying. That would be an example. Recommendation engines, of course, largely powered um, by machine learning and, and all that. And then SEO and search rankings, A-B testing even can be AI. Uh, and then of course, ad tech. So marketing, advertising, the ad tech industry has long been in the game of using AI and machine learning. Uh, but generative AI for creators and for the creator economy is changing the game. So when, when policymakers are thinking about this, I like to break it down and kind of uh, simplify it. So I know a lot of people listening and tuning in are probably used to like high level discussions or like the nitty gritty uh, getting into the weeds. But when we talk about policy, when we talk about gener or crafting laws around these systems, that's where you wanna kind of take a larger view and understand, okay, what are we talking about? And we don't wanna be overly broad in the regulation that we're crafting, but we also don't wanna to be too specific in where it's gonna be just outdated and not even applicable. I see somebody in the chat was talking about Web 2.0, blast from the past. That's right. Like we have to, we have laws on the books, both in the US and overseas and overseas for me and in Europe and otherwise, where you're you're dealing with stuff that might be applicable to Web 2, uh, but but really we're in a Web 3 environment now. And so it's like, well, how do you how do the laws apply there? Uh, maybe they do, maybe there's nothing that needs to be done. But in but going back to the slide right here, this is kind of the three buckets that I, I typically use and, and help people walk through and understand and frame where are we talking about right now? If we're looking and examining a database, the training materials, the training data, I prefer to not use the term training data because to me, the training materials are more than just data. It could be information, so PHI, personal information, uh, it could be copyrighted works, public domain works, creative commons works, or it could also be sensors. So think of internet of things. <laughs> you have your refrigerator that's smart and generating data. Um, it could also be other, other AI models. And so if you're drafting and, and, and trying to understand what, what you're thinking about, that's one bucket that you can kind of put everything into and break it down for people that might not be in the nitty gritty, be in the weeds of, of actually understanding and maybe even designing these systems. Uh, but you, you want to have conversations around how you even contract around them. And then the middle one there is the tool or the model or the system. So of course, once you have the training materials, you can develop a model. That model might be part of a tool or a larger system of other AI powered tools that combine together, create a system. Uh, and so that's where you kind of need to break it down and kind of think about it that, in, in that capacity too. There might be different um, considerations like the large language models that we're seeing now. A lot of the lawsuits that are happening um, there are a lot of lawsuits from the copyright standpoint that are happening around how the databases were were involved in the creation of those large language models. So in that case, we're looking at laws that apply not just to the training materials, but also to the system. How is it being used? Is it being used to compete with the market? So are you trying to use it to put stock photography out of business? Are you using it to generate a new version of Harry Potter? Maybe that's fair use, maybe that's fair dealing, uh, maybe it's not. Uh, that's where courts are now trying to go through and, and understand and kind of decide what is fair, what's not. Uh, do we need new laws that surround this? And so that, that's kind of the distinction there. Um, but then also when we're talking about the systems, uh, under, in, under in a Web 2.0 interface, we have uh, laws on the books here in the US at least for content moderation, so like Section 230 or the DMCA uh, that, that, that deals with copyright. So Section 230 is like platform liability. And so then you you kind of got to think about that and 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 what is the where where does the responsibility go for somebody that's using these tools somebody that's developing these tools and the EU has their AI Act that does that does hint at this and it, it kind of dives into the the weeds of understanding are you talking about somebody that is developing the, the database and sharing the database or are they the distributor of the model or the system are they the operator are they at, are they providing the system as a service are they building it out like ChatGPT does with OpenAI where it's available to a lot of different people. Uh, and then you also have the output. The so output is a more interesting one. And for a creator economy, that's really kind of where we're gonna focus for the next three or four minutes is understanding, okay, what are the liabilities? Where, what are the current laws on the output? And the output could be, like I said, services. It could be content, it could be data. So if you're doing synthetic data or deriv derived data, it could also be automating actions and taking action based on the model. And so, like I said, there's a lot of different um, liabilities, there's a lot of different concepts and, and thoughts that can go into each of these buckets. Some of them overlap, some of them don't. 
All right, so currently in the US, copyright law is only recognizing human authorship. So that's definitely impacting creators. It also impacts brands. So if you're working for a large brand and you're starting to use generative AI and incorporate the output into your marketing materials or your advertising uh, campaigns, you gotta think about, okay, we don't have the normal protections that we would to stop people from infringing on those works uh, from a copyright perspective. That's what you're typically doing from a brand protection strategy. So there are a lot of different issues when it comes to copyright, but in the US, there is no protection. It requires human authorship. Um, and so the other kind of uh, potential issues, but a lot of, a lot of services are, are developing around this, if there's a substantially similar output. So if you generate an image that is in the style of Warhol, I tried to do that in chat GPT four recently, and it told me, oh, nope, I can't do that because it's, you're trying to mirror the name of a, an actual artist. Um, so we won't let you do that. So they're, they're developing tools that prevent that, but that is in other tools, maybe not there. And then of course, in the US, we have name image likeness rights, rights to privacy and publicity. And then there's also no ownership. And so, like I said, no protection against reuse. This is kind of the same thing um, in, across most of Europe, but the UK is a little bit different where they do recognize copyright protection. All right, so again, best practice for if you're using GenAI tools, three different buckets you can kind of think of is the content, is it what you want to protect with copyright? So is it evergreen materials, lead magnets, workbooks, or an actual book or a course? In that case, you want to be strategic in how you use Gen AI tools, at least in the EU and at least in, in the US and other parts of the world, because you might not be able to copyright that. You might not be able to protect what you're actually putting out into the market. And then the third one there is, okay, maybe there are elements of it where you don't care about protecting it. So if, it's, if you have podcast show notes, you don't really care about protecting that for the most part. Or if you have a first draft or you're working through an outline ideation stage, that's typically where you cannot, like you can maybe use AI to do any, to do some of these things. And then the last one is ephemeral content, um, blog posts, uh, email campaigns, social media posts. Maybe you don't really care and you would never care about owning and claiming ownership over that. All right, so regulating AI in the creator economy, um, big tech is definitely under the microscope both in the US and in the EU. As I mentioned, platforms, are they gonna have liability over um, how they're integrating these tools? We're seeing a lot of work on standards and standards development. Um, and, and the last most important thing there is that like regulators are concerned about is our AI system safe, secure, and trustworthy? Are you able to generate deep fakes with it and throw off an election? Those are the types of questions that regulators are asking about. Privacy, of course, everyone cares about privacy in the US. We care about children's privacy at the federal level. And we have, we're working maybe towards some other laws that address privacy. Um, in the US, but for the most part, it's like a disjointed method uh, across different states. But the EU, of course, has GDPR that already touches on automated decision making and then the AI Act and the DSA, all these different laws come into play. And then you also have algorithmic dis discrimination. That's something that people are very worried about is your AI bias or fair. And then of course, displaced workforces. And that kind of moves into the next question of, is, it, is, is gen AI content creation ethical? That's what something a lot of live creators I talk to, a lot of brands are talking about. Uh, is it is it fair to use this? And how transparent do you have to be in using it? Um, are people are your is your audience going to be upset that you're using it if you didn't disclose that you're using it? So, all right, I will stop there. See if there are any questions in the chat. I know that was a lot, but I had 15 minutes, kind of running through, kind of get you up to speed, kind of thinking about some of these things. Uh, I think you did great. Um... Yeah, and, and really appreciate you making these things actionable for us. Uh, I don't yeah. think we'll have time in the next 20 seconds for a <laughs> question. And we keep cutting. We uh, don't want to cut you off. So I uh, will just say thank you. And to, to those in the audience, um, we'll see you in the next session. So thanks so much, Franklin. Thanks, everyone. And here's that slide again if you need it. But look forward to enjoying the rest of the conference. Beautiful. Thank you.